Okay, I guess we're gonna get started here. I'm still working out the kinks. Um, I'm still new to this YouTube stream. But, hello. <laughs> I'm sorry you guys saw me first, because I was like, I'm using this OBS, and, like, I was gonna start exactly at 6. But, uh... It went right. I get it went right to live, and I was like, "Wait, what? I'm live already." Anyway, I'm gonna get better. But hello, and welcome to a chapter a day. I am your host, Miss Petals, and we are gonna continue reading Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. Um, I would also like to mention that the chapter a day by miss petals is sponsored by the seeds of harvest library located 4121 cleveland street gary indiana inside market city friday and sunday 10 30 a.m to 4 p.m to saturday 10 30 a.m to 4 30 p.m please visit them on facebook this is their youtube channel and Check them out on Instagram and Tumblr. And yes, donations are accepted. Hardcover books only. So last time we were together. Oh, I'm sorry. I should also mention that the chapter a day is from Monday through Thursday. Tuesdays we start at 5. Sorry, I couldn't make it to 6, but that's when I have classes. <laughs> But, um, thank you for joining me this evening. So last time we were together, we learned about Montag and a character named Clarice, who opens Montag's mind to the things that are around him, which he's never thought of before. And he's never really sat down in all the, and thought about all of what's going on around him until Clarice gives him the ideas like for example she gives him the idea of actually feeling what grass feels like or noticing people's faces he's never really sat down to watch it and it becomes overwhelming to him to the fact that he even notices his wife who isn't happy and neither is he as we found out about his wife uh, tried to commit suicide but acted like the next day that nothing happened and we left her and him last time with her uh glued to several screens and being part of this show where she only has a couple of lines. So basically think about YouTube or any um, video platform that they don't let you do your own content and don't let you do your own thing, but you have to follow what they say and you have to say the script that they give you. So imagine that kind of video platform today pretty dull and pretty scary but she goes along with it and we left with Montag asking his wife does it have a happy ending and she says well I don't know I haven't read ahead so we are going to continue from where we started from I was hoping we could start at six to give ourselves an hour but I'm just gonna go ahead. Alrighty. The rain was thinning away and the girl was walking in the center of the sidewalk with her head up and the few drops falling on her face. She smiled when she saw Montag. Hello. He said, hello, and then said, what are you up to now? 
I'm still crazy. The rain feels good. I love to walk in it. I don't think I'd like that, he said. You might if you tried. I never have. She licked her she licked her lips. Rain even tastes good. What do you do? Go around trying everything once? He asked. Sometimes twice. She looked at something in her hand. What have you got there? He said. I guess it's the last of the dandelions this year. I didn't think I'd find one on the lawn this late. Have you ever heard of rubbing it under your chin? Look, she touched her chin with the flower laughing. Why? If it rubs off, it means I'm in love. Has it? He could hardly do anything else but look. Well, she said, you're yellow under there. Fine. Let's try you now. It won't work for me. Here, before he could move, she had put the dandelion under his chin. He drew back and she laughed. Hold still. She peered under his chin and frowned. Well, he said, what a shame, she said. You're not in love with anyone. Yes, I am. It doesn't show. I am very much in love. He tried to conjure up a face to fit the words, but there was no face. I am. Oh, please don't look, look that way. It's that dandelion, he said. You used it all up on yourself. That's why it won't work for me. Of course, that must be it. Oh, now I've upset you. I can see I have. I'm really, really, I am. I'm really sorry. She touched his elbow. No, no, he said quickly. I'm all right. I've got to be going. To s so say you forgive me. I don't want you angry with me. I'm not angry. Upset, yes. I've got to go see my psychiatrist now. They make me go. I make up things to say. I don't know what he thinks of me. He says I'm a regular onion. I keep him busy peeling away the layers. I'm inclined to believe you need the psychiatrist, said Montag. You don't mean that. He took a breath and let it out and at last said, no, I don't mean that. The psychiatrist wants to know why I go out and hike around in the forest and watch the birds and collect butterflies. I'll show you my collection someday. Good. They want to know what I do with all my time. I tell them that sometimes I just sit and think, but I won't tell them what. I've got them running. And sometimes I tell them I like to put my head back like this and let the rain fall in my mouth. It tastes just like wine. Have you ever tried it? No, I, you have forgiven me, haven't you? Yes, he thought about it. Yes, I have. God knows why. You're peculiar. You're aggravating, yet you're easy to forgive. You say you're 17? Well, next month. How odd. How strange. And my wife, 30, and yet you seem so much older at times. I can't get over it. You're peculiar yourself, Mr. Montag. Some, sometimes I even forget you're a fireman. Now, may I make you angry again? Go ahead. How did it start? How did you get into it? How did you pick your work? And how did you happen to think to take the job you have? 
You're not like the others. I've seen a few. I know. When I talk, you look at me. When I said something about the moon, you looked at the moon last night. The others would never do that. The others would walk off and leave me talking or threaten me. No one has time anymore for anyone else. You're one of the few who put up with me. That's why I think it's so strange you're a fireman. It just doesn't seem right for you somehow. He felt as his body divide itself into a hotness and a coldness, a softness and a hardness, a trembling and a not trembling, the two halves grinding one upon the other. You'd better run on to your appointment, he said. And she ran off and left him standing there in the rain. Only after a long time did he move. And then very slowly, as he walked, he tilted his head back in the rain for just a few moments and opened his mouth. The mechanical hound slept but did not sleep, lived but did not live in its gently humming, gently vibrating, soft illum softly illuminated kennel back in a dark corner of the firehouse. The dim light of one in the morning. The moonlight from the open sky framed through the great window, touched here and there on the brass and the copper and the steel of the faintly trembling beast. Light flickered on bits of ruby glass and on sensitive capillary hairs in the nylon brushed nostrils of the creature that quivered gently gently its eight legs spidered under it on rubber padded paws montag slid down the brass pole he went out to look at the city and the clouds had cleared away completely and he lit a cigarette and came back to bend down and look at the hound it was like a great bee come home from some field where the honey is full of poison wilderness of insanity and nightmare its body crammed with that over rich nectar and now it was sleeping the evil out of itself hello whispered montag fascinated as always with the dead beast the living beast nights then when things got dull which was every night the men slid down the brass poles and set the tick ticking combinations of the old factory system of the hound and let loose rats in the firehouse air away and sometimes chickens and sometimes cats that would have to be drowned away and there would be betting to see which of the cats or chickens or rats the hound would seize first. So I'm guessing the hound is a robot. The animals were turned loose. Three seconds later, the game was done. The rat, cat, or chicken caught half across the airway, areaway, gripped in gentling paws, while a four-inch hollow steel needle plunged down from the proboscis, proboscis of the hound to inject massive jolts of morphine or procaine. The pawn was then tossed in the incinerator. A new game began. Montag stayed upstairs most nights when this went on. There had been a time two years ago when he had bet with the best of them and lost a week's salary and faced Mildred's insane anger, which showed itself in veins and blotches. But now nights he lay in his bunk, face turned to the wall, listening to the whoops of laughter below and the pian piano string scurry of rat feet the violin squeaking of mice and the great shadowing motion silence of the hound leaping out like a moth in the raw light 
finding, holding its victim, inserting needle, and going back to its kennel to die as if a switch had been turned. Montag touched the muzzle. The hound growled. Montag jumped back. The hound half rose in its kennel and looked at him with green-blue neon light flickering in its suddenly activated eye bulbs. It growled again, a strange rasping combination of electrical sizzle, a frying sound, a scraping of metal, a turning of cogs that seemed rusty and ancient with suspicion. No, no, boy, said Montag, his heart pounding. He saw the silver needle extend upon the air an inch, pull back, extend, pull back. The growl simmered in the beast and it looked at him. Montag backed up. The hound took a step from its kennel. Montag grabbed the brass pole with one hand. The pole reacting slid upward and took him through the ceiling quietly. He stepped off in the half-lit deck of the upper level. He was trembling and his face was green-white. Below, the hound had sunk back down upon its eight incredible insect legs and was humming to itself again, its multi-faceted eyes at peace. Montag stood, letting the fears pass by the drop hole behind him. Four men at a card table under a green-lidded light in the corner glanced brief briefly, but said nothing. Only the man with the captain's hat and the sign of the phoenix on his hat. At last, curious, his playing cards in this thin hand talked across the long room. Montag. It doesn't like me, said Montag. What, the hound? The captain studied his cards. Come off it. It doesn't like or dislike. It just functions. It's like a lesson in ballistics. It has a trajectory we decide on for it. It follows through. It targets itself, homes itself, and cuts off. It's only copper wire, storage batteries, and electricity. Montag swallowed. It, its calculators can be set to any combination. So many amino acids, so much sulfur, so much butter fat and alkaline, right? We know all it, we know all that. All of those chemical balances and percentages on all of us here in the house are recorded in the master file downstairs. It would be easy for someone to set up a partial combination on the hound's memory. A touch of amino acids, perhaps, that would account for what the animal did just now. Reacted toward me. Hell, said the captain. Irritated, but not completely angry, just enough memory. Set up in it by someone, so it growled when I touched it. Who would do a thing like that, asked the captain. You haven't any enemies here, guy. None that I know of. We'll have the hound checked by our technicians tomorrow. This isn't the first time it's threatened me said Montag. Last month it happened twice. We'll fix it up, don't worry. But Montag did not move and only stood thinking of the ventilator grill in the hall at home and what they lay hidden behind the grill. If someone here in the firehouse knew about the ventilator, then mightn't they tell the hound? The captain came over to the drop hole and gave Montag a questioning glance. I was just figuring, said Montag. What does the hound think about down there nights? Is it coming alive on us? Really? It makes me cold. 
It doesn't think anything we don't want it to think. That's sad, said Montag quietly, because all we put into it is hunting and finding and killing. What a shame if that's all it can ever know. Beatty snorted gently. Well, it's a fine bit of craftsmanship. A good rifle that can fetch its own target and guarantees the bullseye every time. That's why, said Montag, I wouldn't want to be its next victim. Why? You got a guilty conscience about something? Montag glanced up swiftly. Beatty stood there looking at him steadily with his eyes while his mouth opened and began to laugh very softly. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven days. And as many times he came out of the house and Clarice was there somewhere in the world. Once he saw her shaking a walnut tree, once he saw her sitting on the lawn knitting a blue sweater, three or four times he found a bouquet of late flowers on his porch or a handful of chestnuts in a little set or some autumn leaves neatly pinned to a sheet of white paper and thumbtacked to his door. Every day Clarice walked him to the corner. One day it was rainy. The next it was clear. The day after that the wind blew strong, and the day after that it was mild and calm. And the day after that calm day was a day like the furnace of summer. And Clarice, with her face all sunburnt by late afternoon. Why is it, he said one time at the subway entrance, I feel I've known you so many years. Because I like you, she said, and I don't want anything from you, and because we know each other. You make me feel very old and very much like a father. Now you explain, she said, why you haven't any daughters, like me, if you love children so much. I don't know. You're joking. I mean, he stopped and shook his head. Well, my wife, she... She just never wanted any children at all. The girl stopped smiling. I'm sorry. I really thought you were having fun at my expense. I'm a fool. No, no, he said. It was a good question. It's been a long time since anyone cared enough to ask. A good question. Let's talk about something else. Have you ever smelled old leaves? Don't they smell like cinnamon? Here, smell. Why, yes. It is like cinnamon in a way. She looked at him with her clear, dark eyes. You always seem shocked. It's just I haven't had time... Did you look at the stretched out billboards like I told you? I think so. Yes, he had to laugh. Your laugh sounds much nicer than it did. Does it? Much more relaxed. He felt at ease and comfortable. Why aren't you in school? I see you every day wandering around. Oh, they don't miss me, she said. I'm antisocial, they say. I don't mix. It's so strange. I'm very social indeed. It all depends on what you mean by social, doesn't it? Social to me means talking to you about things like this. She rattled some chestnuts that had fallen off the tree in the front yard. Or talking about how strange the world is. Being with people is nice, but I don't think it's social to get a bunch of people together and then not let them talk, do you? 
an hour of TV class, an hour of basketball or baseball or running, another hour of transcription history or painting pictures and more sports. But do you know we never ask questions, or at least most don't? They just run the answers at you. Bing, 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 and us sitting there for four more hours of film teacher. That's not social to me at all. It's a lot of funnels and a lot of water poured down the spout and out the bottom and them telling us it's wine when it's not. They run us so ragged by the end of the day, we can't do anything but go to bed or head for a fun park to bully people around. Break window panes in the window smasher place or wreck cars in the car wrecker place with the big street ball. Or go out in the cars and race on the streets trying to see how close you can get to lamppost playing chicken and knock hubcaps. I guess I'm everything they say I am, all right. I haven't any friends. That's supposed to prove I'm abnormal. But everyone I know is either shouting or dancing around like wild or beating up, up one another. Do you notice how people hurt each other nowadays? You sound so very old. Sometimes I'm ancient. I'm afraid of children my own age. That sounds like me. <laughs> they kill each other. Did it always used to be that way? My uncle says no. Six of my friends have been shot in the last year alone. Ten of them died in car wrecks. I'm afraid of them. And they don't like me because I'm afraid. My uncle says his grandfather remembered when children didn't kill each other. But that was a long time ago. When they had things different. They believed in responsibility, my uncle says. Do you know I'm responsible? I was spanked when I needed, when I needed it years ago. And I do all the shopping and the house cleaning by hand. But most of all, she said, I like to watch people. Sometimes I ride the subway all day and look at them and listen to them. I just want to figure out who they are and what they want and where they are going. Sometimes I even go to the fun parks and ride in the jet cars when they race on the edge of town at midnight and the police don't care as long as they're insured. As long as everyone has 10,000 insurance, everyone's happy. Sometimes I sneak around and listen in subways or I listen at soda fountains and do you know what? What? People don't talk about anything. Oh, they must. No, not anything. They name a lot of cars or clothes or swimming pools mostly and say how swell. But they all say the same things and nobody says anything different from anyone else. And most of the time in the cafes, they have the joke boxes on the same jokes most of the time. Or the musical wall lit and all the colored patterns running up and down, but it's only color and all abstract. And at the museums, have you ever seen, have you ever been? All abstract. That's all there is now. My uncle says it was different once. A long time back, sometimes pictures said things or even showed people. Your uncle said your, your uncle said your, you, your uncle must be a remarkable man. He is. He certainly is. Well, I got to be going. Goodbye, Mr. Montag. Goodbye. Goodbye.
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven days. The firehouse. Montag, you shin that pole like a bird up a tree. Third day. Montag, I see you came in the back door this time. The hound bother you? No, no. Fourth day. Montag, a funny thing. Heard tell this morning, firemen in Seattle purposely set a mechanical hound to his own chemical complex and let it loose. What kind of suicide would you call that? Five, six, seven days. And then Clarice was gone. He didn't know what there was about the afternoon, but it was not seeing her somewhere in the world. The lawn was empty, the trees empty, the street empty, and while at first he did not even know he missed her or was even looking for her, the fact was that by the time he reached the subway, there were vague stirrings of dis-ease in him. Something was the matter. His routine had been disturbed. A simple routine, true, established, in a short few days, and yet he almost turned back to make the walk again to give her time to appear. He was certain if he tried the same route, everything would work out fine. But it was late, and the arrival of his train put a stop to his plan. The flutter of cards, motion of hands, of eyelids, the drone of the time voice in the firehouse ceiling. One thirty-five, Thursday morning, November 4th. One thirty-six, one thirty-seven, a.m. The tick of the playing cards on the greasy tabletop, all the sounds came to Montag behind his closed eyes, behind the barriers he had momentarily erected. He could feel the firehouse full of glitter and shine and silence of brass colors, the colors of coins, of gold, of silver. The unseen men across the table were sighing on their cards waiting 145 the voice clock mourned out the cold hour of a cold morning of a still colder year what's wrong montag montag opened his eyes a radio hummed somewhere war may be declared any hour this country stands ready to defend its the firehouse trembled as a great flight of jet planes whistled a single note across the black morning sky. Montag blinked. Betty was looking at him as if he were a museum statue. At any moment, Betty might rise and walk about him, touching, exploring his guilt and self-consciousness. Guilt? What guilt was that? Your play, Montag. Montag looked at these men whose faces were sunburnt by a thousand real and ten thousand imaginary fires whose work flushed their cheeks and fevered their eyes. These men who looked steadily into their platinum igniter flames as they lit their eternally burning black pipes. They and their charcoal hair and soot-colored brows and bluish ash-smeared cheeks where they had shaven close but their heritage showed. Montag started up his mouth, opened. Had he ever seen a fireman that didn't have black hair? Black brows, a fiery face, and a blue still shaved but unshaved look. These men were all mirror images of himself. Were all firemen picked then for their looks as well as their proselytes? The color of cinders and ash about them and the continual smell of burning from their pipes. 
Captain Betty. Sorry, I think it's Beatty. B E A T T Y. There, rising in thunderheads of tobacco smoke, Beatty opening a fresh tobacco packet, crumpling the cellophane into a sound of fire. Montag looked at the cards in his own hands. I, I've been thinking. And the fire last week, about the fire last week, about the man whose library we fixed. What happened to him? They took him screaming off to the asylum. He wasn't insane. Beatty arranged his cards quietly. Any man's insane who thinks he can fool the government and us. I've tried to imagine, said Montag, just how it would feel. I mean to have firemen burn our houses and our books. We haven't any books, but if we did have some. You got some? Beatty blinked slowly. No. Montag gazed beyond them to the wall with the typed list of a million forbidden books. Their names leapt in fire, burning down the years under his axe and his hose, which sprayed not water but kerosene. No. But in his mind, a cool wind started up and blew out of the ventilator grill at home, softly chilling his face, and again he saw himself in a green park talking to an old man, a very old man, and the wind from the park was cold too. Montag hesitated. What? Was it always like this? The firehouse? Our work? I mean, well, once upon a time. Once upon a time, Beatty said. What kind of talk is that? Fool, thought Montag to himself. You'll give it away. At the last fire, a book of fairy tales. He glanced at a single line. I mean, he said, in the old days before homes were completely fireproofed, suddenly it seemed a much younger voice was speaking for him. He opened his mouth and it was Clarice McLean, saying, didn't firemen prevent fires rather than stoke them up and get them going? That's rich, Stoneman and Black drew forth their rule books, which also contained brief histories of the firemen of America, and laid them out where Montag, though long familiar with them, might read. Established 1790 to burn English-influenced books in the colonies, first fireman Benjamin Franklin. Rule number one, answer the alarm quickly. Two, start the fire swiftly. Three, burn everything. Four, report back to firehouse immediately. Five, stand alert for the alarms. Everyone watched Montag. He did not move. The alarm sounded. The bell in the ceiling kicked itself 200 times. Suddenly there were four empty chairs. The cards fell in a flurry of snow. The brass pole shivered. The men were gone. Montag sat in his chair. Below, the orange dragon coughed to life. Montag slid down the pole like a man in a dream. The mechanical hound leapt up in its kennel, its eyes all green flame. Montag, you forgot your helmet. He seized it off the wall behind him, ran, leapt, and they were off. The night wind hammering ab about their siren scream and their mighty metal thunder. It was a flaking three-story house in the ancient part of the city, a century old if it was a day, but like all houses, it had been given a thin fireproof plastic sheath many years ago, and this per preservative shell seemed to be the only thing holding it in the sky. Here we are, the engine slammed to a stop. Beatty, Stoneman, and Black ran up the sidewalk, suddenly odious and fat in their plump fireproof slickers. Montag followed. 
they crashed the front door and grabbed at a woman though she was not running she was not trying to escape she was only standing weaving from side to side her eyes fixed upon a nothingness in the wall as if they had struck her a terrible blow upon the head her tongue was moving in her mouth and her eyes seemed to be trying to remember something and then they remembered and her tongue moved again play the man master ridley we shall this day light such a candle by god's grace in england as i trust shall never be put out enough of that said beady where are they he slapped her face with amazing objectivity and repeated the question the old woman's eyes came to a focus upon beady you know where they are or you wouldn't be here she said stoneman held out the telephone alarm card with the complaint signed in telephone duplicate on the back have reason to suspect attic 11 number number 11 elm city eb that would be miss blake my neighbor said the woman reading the initial all right men let's get them next thing they were up in the musty blackness swinging silver hatchets at doors that were after all unlocked tumbling through like boys all rollick and shout hey a fountain of books sprang down upon montag as he climbed shuddering up the sheer stairwell how inconvenient always before it had been like snuffing a candle the police went first and adhesive taped the victim's mouth and bandaged him off into their glittering beetle cars so when you arrived you found an empty house you weren't hurting anyone you weren't hurting only you were hurting only things and since things really couldn't be hurt since things felt nothing and things don't scream or whimper as this woman might begin to scream and cry out there was nothing to tease your conscience later you were simply cleaning up janitorial work essentially everything is everything to its proper place quick with the kerosene who's got a match but now tonight someone had slipped this woman was spoiling the ritual the men were making too much noise laughing joking to cover her terrible accusing silence below she made the empty rooms roar with accusation and shake down a fine dust of guilt that was sucked in their nostrils as they plunged about it was neither cricket nor correct montag felt an immense irritation she shouldn't be here on top of everything books bombarded his shoulders his arms his un upturned face a book lit almost obediently like a white pigeon in his hand wings fluttering in the dim wavering light a page hung open and it was like a snowy feather and the words delicately painted thereon in all the rush and fervor montag had only an instant to read a line but it blazed in his mind for the next minute as if stamped there with fiery steel time has fallen asleep in the afternoon sunshine he dropped the book immediately another fell into his arms montag up here montag's hand closed like a mouth crashed the book with wild devotion with an insanity of mindlessness to his chest the men above were hurling shovelfuls of magazines into the dusty air they fell like slaughtered birds and the woman stood below like a small girl among the bodies montag had done nothing his hand had done it all his hand with a brain of its own with a conscience and a curiosity in each trembling finger and turned thief had turned thief now it's plunged now it plunged the book back under his arm pressed it tight to sweating armpit rushed out empty with a magician's flourish look here innocent look he gazed shaken at the white hand he held it 
he held it way out as if he were far sighted. He held it close as if he were blind. Montag, he jerked about. Don't stand there, idiot. The books lay like great mounds of fishes left to dry. The men danced and slipped and fell over them. Titles glittered, their golden eyes falling gone. Kerosene. They pumped the coal fluid from the Numerland 451 tanks strapped to their shoulders. They coated each book. They pumped rooms full of it. They hurried downstairs, Montag staggering after them in the kerosene fumes. Come on, woman. The woman knelt among the books, touching the drenched leather and cardboard reading, the glit titles with her fingers, while her eyes accused Montag. You can't ever have my books, she said. You know the law, said Beatty. Where's your common sense? None of those books agree with each other. You've been locked up here for years with a regular damned Tower of Babel. Snap out of it. The people in those books never lived. Come on now. She shook her head. The whole house is going up, said Beatty. The men walked clumsily to the door. They glanced back at Montag, who stood near the woman. You're not leaving her here, he protested. She won't come. Force her, then. Beatty raised his hand, in which was concealed the igniter. We're due back at the house. Besides, these fanatics always try suicide. The pattern's familiar. Montag placed his hand on the woman's elbow. You can come with me. No, she said. Thank you anyway. I'm counting to ten, said Beatty. One, two. Please, said Bontag. Go on, said the, said the woman. Three, four. Here, Montag pulled at the woman. The woman replied quietly, I want to stay here. Five, six, you can stop counting, she said. She opened the fingers of one hand slightly, and in the palm of the hand was a single slender object, an ordinary kitchen match. The sight of it rushed the men out and down away from the house. Captain Beatty, keeping his dignity, backed slowly through the front door, his pink face burnt and shiny from a thousand fires and night excitements. God! thought Montag. How true. Always at night the alarm comes. Never by day. Is it because fire is prettier at night? More spectacle? A better show? The pink face of Beatty now showed the faintest panic in the door. The woman's hand twitched on the single matchstick. The fumes of kerosene bloomed up after her. Montag felt the hidden book pound like a heart against his chest. Go on, said the woman, and Montag felt himself back away and away out the door. After Beatty down the steps across the lawn, where the path of kerosene lay like the track of some evil snail. On the front porch, where she had come to weigh them quietly with her eyes. Her quietness, a condemn a condemnation, the woman stood motionless. Beatty flicked his fingers to spark the kerosene. He was too late, Montag gasped. The woman on the porch reached out with contempt to them all and struck the kitchen match against the railing. People ran out of houses all down the street. They said nothing on their way back to the firehouse. Nobody looked at anyone else. Montag sat in the front seat with Beatty and Black. They did not even smoke their pipes. They sat there looking out the front of the great salamander as they turned a corner and went silently on. Master Riley, said Montag at last. What? said Beatty. She said 
Master Ridley. She said some crazy thing when we came to the came in the door. Play the man, she said, Master Rod Ridley. Something, something, something. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put on, said Beatty. Stone Man glanced over at the captain, as did Montag, startled. Beatty rubbed his chin. A man named Latimer said that to a man named Nicol Nicholas Ridley, as they were being burnt alive at Oxford for heresy on October 16th, 1555. Montag and Stoneman went back to looking at the street as it moved under the engine wheels. I'm full of bits and pieces, said Beatty. Most fire captains have to be. Sometimes I surprise myself. Watch it, Stoneman. Stoneman break the truck. Damn, said Beatty. You've got right you've gone right by the corner where we turn for the firehouse. Who is it? Who would it be? said Montag, leaning ag back against the closed door in the dark. His wife said at last, Well, put on the light. I don't want the light. Come to bed. He heard her roll impatiently. The bed springs squealed. Are you drunk? she said. So it was the hand that started it all. He felt one hand and then the other work his coat free and let it slump to the floor. He held his pants out into an abyss and let them fall into darkness. His hands had been infected and soon it would be his arms. He could feel the poison working up his wrists and into his elbows and his shoulders. And then the jump over from shoulder blade to shoulder blade like a spark leaping at a gap. His hands were ravenous, and his eyes were beginning to feel hunger, as if they must look at something, anything, everything. His wife said, What are you doing? He balanced in space with the book in his sweating cold fingers. A minute later, she said, Well, just don't stand there in the middle of the floor. He made a small sound. What? she asked. He made more soft sounds. He stumbled toward the bed and shoved the book clumsily under the cold pillow. He fell into bed and his wife cried out, startled. He lay far across the room from her on a winter island separated by an empty sea. She talked to him for what seemed a long while and she talked about this and she talked about that and it was only words like the words he had heard once in a nursery at a friend's house. A two-year-old child building word patterns, talking jargon, making pretty sounds in the air. But Montag said nothing and after a long while when he only made the small sounds he felt her move in the room and come to his bed and stand over him and put her hand down to feel his cheek he knew that when she pulled her hand away from his face it was wet late in the night he looked over at mildred she was awake there was a tiny dance of melody in the air her seashell was tan tamped in her ear again and she was listening to far people in far places her eyes wide and staring at the fathoms of blackness above her in the ceiling wasn't there an old joke about the wife who talked so much on the telephone that her desperate husband ran out to the nearest store and telephoned her to ask what was for dinner well then why didn't he buy himself an audio shell, seashell broadcasting station and talk to his wife late at night, murmur, whisper, shout, scream, yell? But what would he whisper? What would he yell? What could he say? And suddenly she was so strange he couldn't believe he knew her at all. 
he was in someone else's house like those other jokes people told of the gentleman drunk coming home late late at night unlocking the wrong door entering a wrong room and bedding with a stranger and getting up early and going to work and neither of them the wiser Millie Millie he whispered what I didn't mean to startle you what I want to know is well when did we meet and where when did we meet for what she asked I mean originally he knew she must be frowning in the dark he clarified it the first time we ever met where was it and when why it was at she stopped I don't know she said he was cold can't you remember it's been so long only 10 years that's all only 10 don't get excited I'm trying to think she laughed an odd little laugh that went up and up funny how funny not to remember where or when you met your husband or wife he lay massaging his eyes his brow and the back of his neck slowly he held both hands over his eyes and applied a steady pressure there as if to crush memory into place it was suddenly more important than any other thing in a lifetime that he know where he had met mildred it does it doesn't matter she was up in the bathroom now and he heard the water running and the swallowing sound she made no i guess not he said he tried to count how many times she swallowed and he thought of the visit from the two zinc oxide faced men with the cigarettes in their straight line mouths and the electronic eyed snake winding down into the layer upon layer of night and stone and stagnant spring water and he wanted to call out to her how many have you taken tonight the capsules how many will you take later and not now and not know and so on every hour or maybe not tonight tomorrow night and me not sleeping tonight or tomorrow night or any night for a long while now that this has started and he thought of her lying on the bed with the two technicians standing straight over her not bent with concern but only standing straight arms folded and he remembered thinking then that if she died he was certain he wouldn't cry for it would be the dying of an unknown a street face a newspaper image and it was suddenly so very wrong that he had begun to cry not at death but at the thought of not crying at death a silly empty man near a silly empty woman while the hungry snake made her still more empty how do you get so empty he wondered who takes it out of you and that awful flower the other day the dandelion it had summed up everything hadn't it what a shame you're not in love with anyone and why not? Well, wasn't there a wall between him and Mildred when you came down to it? Literally, not just one wall, but so far three. And expensive, too. And the uncles, the aunts, the cousins, the nieces, the nephews that lived in those walls, the gibbering pack of tree apes that said nothing, nothing nothing and said it loud 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 he had taken to calling them relatives from the very first how's uncle lewis today who and aunt maud the most significant memory he had of mildred really was of a little girl in a forest without trees how odd 
or rather a little girl lost on a plateau where there used to be trees. You could feel the memory of their shapes all about, sitting in the center. Center of the living room. The living room. What a good job of labeling that was now. No matter when he came in, the walls were always talking to Mildred. Something must be done. Yes, something must be done. Well, let's not stand and talk. Let's do it. I'm so mad I could spit. What was it all about? Mildred couldn't say. Who was mad at whom? Mildred didn't quite know. What were they going to do? Well, said Mildred, wait around and see. He had waited around to see. A great thunderstorm of sound gushed from the walls. Music bombarded him at such an immense volume that his bones were almost shaken from their tendons. He felt his jaw vibrate, his eyes wobble in his head. He was a victim of concussion. When it was all over, he felt like a man who had been thrown from a cliff, whirled in a centrifuge, and spat out over a waterfall. That fell and fell into emptiness, an emptiness and never quite touched bottom. Never, never quite, not, no, not quite touched bottom. And you fell so fast you didn't touch the sides either. Never quite touched anything. The thunder faded, the music died. There, said Mildred. And it was indeed remarkable. Something had happened, even though the people in the walls of the room had barely moved, and nothing had really been settled. You had the impression that someone had turned on a washing machine or sucked you up in a gigantic vacuum. You drowned in music and pure cacophony. He came out of the room sweating and on the point of collapse. Behind him, Mildred sat in her chair and the voices went on again. We'll stop there for today, but isn't that something? realizing you've been with someone for 10 years and you don't know them but Mildred doesn't know Montag at all she's stuck in her own world it seems if she's not looking in front of a screen she's listening to her seashells which would be our airpods today and Clarice she she's I could definitely identify with her like people would call her or somebody like me an old soul like we remember before technology came we remember just how to live and what she talked about her she couldn't identify with young people I couldn't understand I couldn't even identify with my own age and that would have been a prop that was always a problem for me because I always thought differently and I'm always thinking but think about if you lived in a world and we're I unfortunately we're coming to a world that's getting close to what Montag's world is looking like imagine being called crazy for thinking I mean we're already there pretty much but just thinking about things whereas in Montag's world in his own personal world he's never done it before and he's experiencing that for the first time really sitting down and thinking about things like from our first meeting together with me and you we realized that Montag isn't happy he realized he wasn't happy and now we realize that he now wants to read books because he's, he's hitting a book and he's starting to show emotion for other people like the like the woman they came to burn they came to burn her books and house but she 
burnt herself alive. Wow. Like, would y'all, would any of you do that? I know it's like, well, the book, you know, books are books, you know, I, I need to, I need to live, but really, would y'all protect your books like that? Would you go down with your books if you were in the world of Fahrenheit 451? Just imagine you, and, and, and going back to Clarice, she had to go to, she has to go see a psychiatrist for thinking rational thoughts. So let's, let's think about that. Let's think about that for our next time, which is tomorrow. So tomorrow we'll be on at five o'clock and we will continue reading for an hour a day. And I want to say, have a good night. And remember, a chapter a day keeps ignorance at bay and imagination at play. See you tomorrow.